e ngā hau e whā. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tāne, whakapiripiri, e tū nei. Rongo mā rai roa, e tā koutou nei. Tēnā korua. Ki ngā huia kaimanoa, kwa ngaro ki te pou, mō e mai rā koutou. Rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou. E mihi ana ki te kaupapa, e whakahuihui nei i a tātou. Nā rera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Ben Bulban te maunga, ko River Boyne te awa, ko Airehi te iwi. Ko Brathi rawa, ko Connacht ngā hapu, ko Ifa ahau. Whakatau rangia e te ki tā kua ke pupu ake nei te mauri o te aroha. He honga ki te iwi kua whakangaro i te pō. Te pō uri uri ki te pō i o te atu. Ke ngā whaka o a ti herea ki te rangi. He hua rahi atu ti he mauri o rā. Tēnā koutou, nau mai haramai, fo atiroi, fo welcome to this session of Kurch International Festival of Literature. My name is Aoife Finn, we'd like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, all in the Gaeltakta, and to our writers who are with us here today, and to you for joining us. We have Michal O'Connela, we have Hannah O'Regan and Charisma Rangiponga, and Moira Udofi. We will begin with a reading by Michal O'Connela, and his piece is about the is set in the context of the tomb, um, mother and baby homes. Um, Michal, can you tell us a little bit about the the importance of place names in that context of the language of the place names in that context? Um, as a writer, I would have to admit that I didn't think too much about place names in general, and this. This story um, forced me into another situation where I had to um, think of place names and connect them with the story. And um, therefore, um, there's a big difference between East Galway and West Galway. And this story is most, mostly based in East Galway. And there's a language difference. There's the geography, very different. And um, the place names, very different. We have the sea, we have the mountains. Uh, we have the the bad land and the rich land. The good land is in East Galway, and um, so I had all that in my mind, and I tried to kind of create a story uh, and bring out as many of the place names as possible. Um, some of the place names are fiction, fictions, ones are created; uh, others are ones that are real. Um, but the one that are that I created are sound maybe more real than the real place names. Um, I did that because it's um, it's it's fiction really. Um, although like most fiction, it could very well be true. And as a background, I picked the um, scandal in the um, tomb, um, mother and baby home, which um, came to light some years ago, where. It's estimated about maybe seven, eight hundred young children, babies, unborn babies, born babies, up to maybe two years were found in the ground there, and people didn't seem to know anything about them. Uh, they were just there for years, and no proper burial, no headstones, no names. And now this is coming to light in, in our country, and there's been a commission of inquiry about them. And the question is, what will happen next? And um, would they be um, exhumed, etc., and, and and given back to the given a proper burial somewhere else? 
Um, and that is the background I use for, for this story. Um, I imagine an 80-year-old man come into the inn of his life and the skull of his sister that he obviously never knew, never met, is delivered to him um, through DNA testing, etc. And he is unsure of what to do with it. And um, so I bring that into the background and also the, um, the, the history and the religion, which had been a big part of his life. And, and he is there and not sure how to cope with this situation. Wonderful. So Thank I you. will um, go ahead with the reading. And uh, the story, as often happens when you start writing, the story begins to grow. And I wrote, I, I think we were told to write 1,700 words. And uh, I, I end up with 4,000 words. So I cut this down. So I would just read an extract from the story. And it's called, uh, in Irish, Unbleased So Much are the skull in the pan. Er ur evi wai, has she tamal a maiden darish, in chingon tabon, harn she doris in ye in the year, agasothe ek shul she's boiling a glana, ich jo and chlada. She's a harigin tanachish is crookan a meal talk. We a kit talk he's a boka a hackedege, ag saying lim good doc some ways. E a mool new agree a washe. Lena Vera, my dear Shul Slavelle, Shul Chelesh, had a Nari Glanach, or Dwatu, Agus Kukana Nanach. Dear Shahana Kayaka is a Stachs Nagaranta, a Viakin Tibo, as Muinte Egmolu Egujako, Kukana Shangan, my Mirshed in a Bollock Leg Rain, Garion Kukan, my Mirshed Spree, Sidon of Halak V, Clash Hain is A in the Vassal. Garian Tober, my mir, green, fearish gila fall, come a kench to mock with has a yoko. Ober the howl the shale at Chiligon Garanty, on Nolin, on Gari Ard, Gari Nogero, on Gari Down, Gari Nwati, Kuradoro, Spaladoro, Alas a grave, Falky Sigre Guminicanta, a crock mus eyebre. Pian drama is laced of your wasser, Talloch in the lava, Blian in your Blianna, Andro on tail. Apa homelesh. Lushelesh had a guardian hulkis guarding an hour, Nugashe, ich to Lugorin, a male uskut in a farige. Dear Shamach, a hala on from Pony was a hold, a lewari gewold, a wee banach in a car. Pushe ruling like Harry the Gallery Dover is Hassan Shin. Is a egligan diliohonu wogrihi in yes, kimiko kurmach da edum rocker. If the loch look the log lean on. Dear Shasser, dear Shasher. Dear Shasser, it is a macha from the gown, is a style kinchin, mother on woohoo in yes. When chin a banyung thigand on a kate of lakes and a shanskil to lakes, a clash of share in talloch, near on a scale ach. Good hobbing honey color is not head. On Nahre, head of your Nahre shoe, and I'm not out of all the rain wapper. Do you not wait at the hole in a reno cart now work call? Dabon of Connemara, be torn in a kin town, few my within a dumb rule, such cheer is a mahu a head. We kin to the kin, fin a limish there, fin a glinster. Head is queen a shay, is shanna her sheer ye canna her a gritina engine. Spied Pinius Narda, Color is Shedding or is Drog Eder, Drog Fawi is Divas, Art Milafina, Teal Ella, Tanga Ella, Jam Ella. Said, said, said as Mina Shay. Head every bell on the Slua is to him. No to him dark walling, Marahogoch Nashan unto the air. Go a ye gag of fora, Go a ye flock of Fanta. Dashay and Blisk in the wash. More a wagger to go ned and made in Shahain. In ned as in wood, in ned as in bowed salach at Bartish and head, on dawah four flock dalachashin, on tishke fi hala. Hushas drank a hay and was jump a sheer, a lair log force in the folk, a mahu gear in the maiden at a grin, a hula heen. Nahnachanach on nodrudit at Duce, the sake stopper, a log on the yanov, 
Oi mi kimin a vi ajer on bale here is in bale head. Dear chef we go swing to her blast folk and the clock of gobacha. A vi on our do hain in east rig, my very shake fast as in tala. Scarred in the crush of more a plant bow in the lar, don't not be a do hain, but a kudu. Jedi la dumbo harichi, a kahal scarred at Doraha, sheer a hua. A chitin, a light yorn on Dawile, a ya head is a ya here. Also, a young clamper, a groggy, go glor of Kalanok of the Hun, hit scoot, let a heel. Dumboshe, a clay, a thought to hula cladder, some dundurlin, so was an iron heart, a hope she I nugo fresh shake for con in your. Has she in chin, a grand woman, a warrigge. It is an anale game of why. Hoga Hana had him chop, go real to a Agus A in the photo ring. Big shake fighter air is a kindless hame, say Brian Womach and Wadiger, Maradoc shake pied it off in the onal, father of me eye to it, no got us all exhumed the least. No law on Guac shed Yoda in the hood, sprang fat you said. Yoda is Sula a Hanaher. Free Homicky Day is Willis Holland Kilish Vaduce, a Gaharish pied a Hanaher. On Hodian Hog America, a Duce and Chen, who in charge a Hagamut and Nafuk Dernahor. Go crook on the yore. Exu like a wreck with Dunwer Yander Eel is either an altan mole, a short cheer, coon the guy of it. Smeeche at a rough hole, said a guy in Tavian, Brienton Hirschen, Gamade go call ye a hot cheer, ye a octo, ye a heel. Ye kind a smart kind, shutty. Fuck the nish is there out to be east, yet Emihil that gui some of the shot ye. We talked there. A heaver and took the stow, the state that Zuas bore him in the shaka. Jor a yuga, come again, see a lay as mean a shay, a good guard to Kudaka, my hale. Hugh Chalesh, Hargarian Rato, Harwalian sick house, Harkrokon and Toop, Harhoundach no Maka shoe. Bearn and a gorp, a duchalesh hain, a bunty a happy, the sex top was called a hosan, a sneeze jack to guile on Narna. We are not in fear and less gah of Gustisha. Dugden a he will not try to boo. Hawk shan please come as a folk of his yard colour. Jacob's dachs and Norn Achen Hadish, I'll just turn off a fanacht. A fanacht. I'm sure the paint lich as queen shay, near socket and ballach, my stopper against the push. No good dagger saga to free break with the macha's scalp. I wish just a Norn in a mirror shall no good man from Corp is in Horn of the Effort at a Malachon and Kille. Bin a mir on, this vir early here lesh at a ghoul lord sour to east. A wide and no stop and shaw a fabrian to father of Himmeshe. Panic Shehene led in a oge. Usha er happy. Not a crush of relic while in slave, hash shaking at his dear and a yachty umodula, a v a big in these Harakoli a hale. Kuyako clean to crum to Marvedish a gear mahamus. Chile a fak was a hole, Marvedish tavrega who divalish there. Achniza when who dunege hollish there. We clayaho is gunsi a reliquary, is gatti, chorinachi, Marvaka tach rivet woundy, no shin will hossint. A king hossint a hest on a mighty, or crav with yarty, or least gun of dishte. Can Hossin to Hasta inish or Mlisk Velk Bushisha? Coral Cossin to the Hasta. Hush, when it's made a mooshkit. Carrick and Afton. He and Chinagoni hesh made a brian. Schneefer snitty egg amshir in the ginta. A kate a brian inish or leo and Aftonmancha. Chakas Kurigail to Afton the Hui, a Wahala Kimluhan, no Komoro. Cro Altora. Erin Garig Lom Yaham Altor Krua Klochia In the Shasago Hudras of Kunchen Fos Udras Dana Dalba O Altor Eleu Awahir Gohit Malacht Ara in the Hirshin Malacht Sagart Is Dirtar Gomiran Malacht Sagart Sha Dun So there it is, um, a shorter version of the story. 
karamelam mai agat meha that was beautiful thank you extremely worthy subject um can you tell us a little bit about the um you said you used real place names and also um made up place names can you tell us a little bit more about that uh, well it's a decision every writer has to make um whether the, no matter what subject they're writing about um, in this case, um, I wanted to, to set the story in a certain area. And some of the place names I used are outside that area. But to make it realistic, it, it would be impossible for the old man to, to go around the whole places. Uh, for example, uh, Crook on the Njord is actually a place name from the Iron Islands, where, where the people used to sit down on the rocks and watch the sailing ships go to America, because that's the last place they would see that people go into America. So that is on the Iron Islands, maybe 20, 30 miles away. But I brought that into the story um, because it would be unrealistic for the character to walk to the Iron Islands and back again in the same day. Um, but about place names in general, I mean, one of our great writers who wrote mostly in English, Lima Flaherty, um, from the Iron Islands actually, wrote about maybe 20 novels, um, uh, 20, 30 books of short stories. But all the time he used fake place names, you know, uh, nearly, nearly always. I don't think he, he ever used real place names, uh, but they were so they were so close to the place names. You know, they were you, you would know you would kind of know where he meant, um, you know, by the place name. And, and that's partly what I did in this story, because um, I live in this area and there are people who would know the place names and they say, well, that place is not that close to that place and that would be impossible, etc. So in this case, I, I was, you know, I, I brought in mixed up place names uh, and, um, and used them. Uh, it's quite fascinating, actually. I think there's a difference here between Irish language writers and English language writers. I find a lot of the English poets, they seem to love to include a lot of place names in their English poetry in Ireland. And I have a feeling it's maybe because of the sound of the words. Um, for us, in Irish, we know the place name, we know what it means, we don't make any big deal about it. But for those writing in English, it's an anglicized word. Uh, basically, they, they were translated using the same sound in English, so the word means nothing in English, although the sound can be quite nice and nice to listen to on the ear. So maybe that's why lots of the English writers, especially the poets, seem to include a lot of place names in their poetry. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but as I said, um, as an Irish language writer, I didn't think that much about place names before. Um, and I, I thought about it for this story because I was forced into it as you are when you are asked to write a certain piece about a certain topic. Um, so I hope Maybe it is maybe not a bad thing and something I can um, develop more maybe uh, into the future and bring more place names into uh, my creative fiction. Yeah. It was wonderful. I, I, the richness of it, um, I personally couldn't tell the difference when I was reading in the, the made up ones and the, and the real ones. They were, they were, they okay. weaved very well together, I think. Yeah, so. yeah. And sometimes I, I just couldn't chop them and put two, put two half place names together, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and but th that's quite quite easy enough. I mean, as you know, every field, every stone has a, has, a, has a name around in the countryside in Ireland, and you know some of them are based on 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 the colours, on religion, maybe on history, on the geography, on events that happened, on the owners, people who own the land, uh, and um, so there is that that connection there, and it's it it happens naturally. That's the way. I mean. That's the way you, you knew a certain field from another field. If you were sent on an urn or a job, it might be the the goat's field or the the the, the hillock of the ants or whatever. So thank you, Mihal. That was wonderful, uh And we'll continue now with uh Moira E. Goofy, who has written a piece based on the set in the Iron Islands where she was born and brought up. Um Hello, Moira. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, um, about this piece, and especially what it means at this time of year for you know, the Aran Islands, the language, how it connects to um, nature and the, the calendar as such? Okay, Gornadia um, 
before this project began, I'd been thinking about this in the coming summer. Uh, last year, probably because of COVID, we, we had a huge tourist uh, business during the summer. We had thousands of people coming in every day for four, five, six months now. And um, I'm not involved in that business myself. Um, it's fantastic in a way. It keeps people... It keeps uh, the population on the islands. There's a livelihood. There's a, there's an earning there for a lot of the young people. A lot of people have set up their own businesses as well. And at the same time, you'd have to wonder uh, how this is going to affect our uh, language, our natural environment, and how we see ourselves. As well as that, it's um, this is mass tourism. Not that we've always had tourism on the islands, but in when I was younger, it would have been maybe um, we probably consider the island to be crowded if we had thirty or forty people staying, mainly staying for a week, maybe two weeks, and mixing with the locals. A lot of them learning Irish, um, authors, writers, people like that. Um, people from colleges, students, but now we have people, these tourists come in for maybe an hour, maybe two, and they're off again. And it's a totally different uh, way of, a different type of tourist, a different type of tourism. And it does, it has to affect us, um, maybe not at the moment, but for the next generation, uh, young people involved in the business are going to see life in a different way. Uh, when it comes to the place names, um, the our fields are very small. A lot of our land is probably what you call manufactured, in that uh, a lot of our our ancestors, three hundred years, four hundred years ago, they would have inherited uh, very rocky fields, very rocky land, and they actually made the land and manufactured it. But it's not really being used to the same extent anymore. So. The place names were, were important, as Michal mentioned earlier on. They were very important because you needed to know where the cow was, where the where the goats were that particular week, that particular day. Um, we had to bring water uh, in buckets to the, uh, to the cattle as well. Cattle at that time would have been probably a cow and one calf. That would be about it. So um, that's all changed now. So that's how I linked in with the place names. Um, when I started writing then, the story, which is actually true, um, came to me suddenly that when I was in primary school, our teacher at the time was very interested in our place names. He wasn't from this island, he was from one of the other islands. So uh, he wanted to, um, he was very interested in our place names, especially uh, because they hadn't been written down at that stage, they hadn't been recorded. Uh, so uh, he, um, he had a project, he had us doing a project on place names. And one that baffled him, it turns out to be the place where I ended up building my house. So I kind of built the story around that. All the place names are actual, um, they are actual place names. More than half of them relate to land um, belonging to my, my family, my parents. And the others are different place names around. Uh, things have changed in that we're very lucky in that there was a huge project uh, 21 years ago now, 20 years ago. Uh, where all the place names, all the island place names were recorded and mapped. And that was really important because uh, as the generations go, as the years pass, all these uh, play, people are going to forget because if you're not using the place names, if you're not using the words, they're going to be forgotten. And as well as that, a lot of the stories relating to how these places got their names uh, were recorded as well, although I, think, I believe part two of that project is going to start sometime next year, where the stories that are just written, but they haven't been published, they haven't been kind of put together in book format or in any kind of format really, they're going to be all kind of put together and we'll have more, um, we'll have more information, we'll have more stories. Um, I would probably know some of the stories relating to the village that I grew up in, but I wouldn't really know the stories from the other side of the island. Now, having said that, the island is only about two and a half miles by two and a half miles, so it's not exactly huge, but uh, you kind of stick to your own part of the island, I suppose. So all the place names are actual, and the stories are actual. Uh, it's a Everything in the story actually happened. So... Um, that's it, basically. Um, I was wondering whether 
our children in the primary schools uh, and the primary school and the secondary school, uh, you know, they should be, I think they should be made aware of these. I think it should be part of their curriculum, their language curriculum, because it's important. Because um, we're just bringing in tourists and bringing them to see the lighthouse and to see a few of the churches. There's a lot more to the island than that. There's all this hidden, we have hidden sources of information. We have a hidden history that, uh, that you won't get in a day or in an hour. You know, you need to stay and uh, get to know these. So that's it, basically. Wonderful. Thank you. So um, I'll start then. Uh, Bhuilich Craig is scary. And Bhuilich and Agnes are the team we're going to tour. Not to will have all the time. Can't help but chip on the Bhuilich. Rang a shade on on a backlet on the nish. Their master. Thus had to rewire. Be keen to grow some. Now, at the end of the day, the cat is not the cat. 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 The cat is not Craig of Craig a Jeremy Shugustadach. Aber Richter, he Craig Eric Lord the Nishege. The Savile, round the Kuntra to Rotcham, be Hachin of Fragra on, and Count Kerth, as a Count Kuntra, no Benevi Ivory Mahamsa. Craig of Craig a V. Rossa Shomer a Kunasul Rain, a Skap Nagra Meshke to hear him. Ranawar as a master, as he to Strahul and a Sihan be jerk to hear him. Ne Saudon the Shkitilavima. Nor was the while a fear of the tired, can't hand him hug and chair a moiler, no one correction. I could scream for the she, sir. As common as free let you, a high scream, jeer of Marjera Shay. Chicken too? Chicken, my van. Your hug shay in a harum, the clarty barley yonna. Can her a makin to herbe, free dull moors allow revdichter, if he lay in a little meditab of Halo Nishke. A hair on a fragro when he came to imagine. If you measure the doors, nor he in a mare. Look, Anne, no he, a gem of war, I see her seems of Uncle Nosha. I had to find a good job at the time. While I'm planning to have a young girl who is a little girl in Trinona, we should have a good job at the time. But if we have a good job, we should have a good job. You are a good job, we should have a good job. 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 We should have Dan trot in a tiebrachy, and Dorlin axe the paddy. Bavo eemly vein let through Janagam a war. Kerry will do cappy fuck on the let through Maravaka to Schrifter. Need ear shaking for ain vuel el, the Jerem Hain, at the dark hest of Ragertam and ain ear one. Axe has come off in let through a high scrape martha shavarche. Badalam goin mach care the hitch mach, the lower lower lana, nor a bile of Krichnium. A lady of a scale, the Dush Mavar, Marsh to scull a rag, come off in let through. Erechi, it is good by a kind to Agasbagana Saintish, Craig or Brecht, we scrief them. As we inchin of Father Swan Chillums. When the plain to heart, we manage to take a rash with his hair, it is jab all, a monus a monska, from a hen muscular all trav. We yucker go in and a hila, locked the oil receive, at Halam a winter, Rarona, Chaho Hogalon. Go in and a kiss, much a guy in the excavic in the cool of Conde Belade. Tan Sif Shin Rovirk. Dorulam Sanefica Rotten Rark, a Taki Shakaila Vod the Magina, a Slas Sail Tokia Moskalam Hostas Hain. Ach, we chill a rag of air, Vienos Kamalum Finrod, such a good comport of the hero in no perspects. Agustimo Yashin a look, Tasha Rohag, and Dow Sher Hashtagalish Chakshan Shah. Yak Shaved and Mapak Sashamach, he's been when Yagame, hitched the drool with a drawler. A rashic pile in your laid ain rage of Edish Gale. We see Toki had a hen, a codelegant child, a rain feast of Talon, if he come rock and wild, because the sheriff is she a father has to. Near I had a hundred lemme ear of sea, the Hanak the Hinnig and the Cousin. Chicken to Hain, who will share, the Chagalash Gallach, Kasai Bra Mara, a Hregge Champ, and a Brano Mach and a Moy. Well, Hans, can I show when a king ten hen, La Fad and the Gar. V. Carcalor, Coop the Boy, the Yas in the Winter Line, the Kraga, the Hutchin Gunilla, and the Hulay Hunion. We call their tea, and Scan and not Hood. We can't achieve here in the land's grow boy. 
Brano Shear or a son of Salah, Pied and Motain of Sinish Mount. A new lane is Garaha, Lectrus Nakabla phone, Chacht Nard and Weaver than the Hotchisha, than Trotter Hang the Jalin. In Kalnak of a homely gun while and Narshansakin said, Visha at a drawer, Pivisha with Limisha Kivni. Nikad of we ain't all Galahan, not few and Taro Baloo and a Hly, nor Sconsa. A new ratada la Kyle. Scrivo Lectrus Hivy gained Piax a garbage, Sholo Testamere of the Hogard Walla. Because San Jarab done to the GF in the Corlaconde, to go Politur no Hoa Bard, how Sam Askatu done to the Be, Axajer here Hall, Vilam. Tishtug of Lien, Vimahar told Kie, Sha, Greg of Rick. Viro Namagoni, Anim the Craig, Usaj Maranim Chi, a Craig of Rick, this initial higma figure on the scene of the Marshals and Anim Oddichin. Kerhi a Mire Brockenshaw, but was mad. Near us a not with the house of Tolkien Nish, nor for Michelthal, a cloch of a slack. No go clue them a egg or a hale, the fold of a sealer, ferment a scandal a trough. A bus tea, nor van with a count and chanter, count tea gentle, scap with a monchard. The marolet, nor a aim brocks and not chardian. Near to a set to lishin. Tabriella are no lish a buckle brock, salach. Is minica inching log animal frigo, and kinal usage a wanchy as a talus and amical heart. Pudding the noon, well in the mala, garring the noon. Ra on a draw will a trot to the Mogan Valley here, so natural my hearts are told finish. Mavi, need shagreen and the lane in his moon. More hut cloth as gall hut cray, which a film marching or geron from the Hilanchana. The Andro Banch left house a hood at Halus or Mare. Can't cheat this marching, Anne and Bashed in those slinna and chair who among the Slavic that took her notch. Tabula Amenan, Craig Stack, Craig Wallace, Gorsby Rogan, Axelorella. Horlich the flesh and the piece about Talon, and no such be set to Rohir Stach, the Scavanacha animal in March in the year. Shut in the gear, gallo or rot in the tail, drawn around seal by the Hutton and the Hillan. Astle and Slinnet on Chance, Craig Eve Dick Major, Marsha, near Wild and Slinna Auditchin. My yard at Mirgardi Coast to Lonnie and Char, a gustur fire ex Chach Solishan, be made Irish bearless in Hillan and Galawad cheer. Is a mare at Hagrich, as a Hagri the Goni, might in a hotchup and drum shell or heel and verla, as going to course he should have one yob, the coast guards and lighthouse and station and boathouse. Rich Elum Gaveta Cabell Fuckle Bearla, Rick at Tanchine, Craig and Rick. Is Kincha Ganyaha, Nogar Kudu, Sai ex barge galore, Gatun Pile, as the Faragi Harton Chell, as Gadagar Armad, as the Nahe, Jira Hladi Nilam. Vir Kudwa Smogalala Shoe Threshen, with his Kelchi and Tarvashin. A mile a rack or a in Tarva on, and the Coast Guards. A Satshaha gun the Hanim Nahi, Gari in the Baki, it was Pal Tabak. A Matashkail on the while in the Jade of Lishanacha Amsa, near Alma Fosse. Nimoja can out Alma Alamar, Kimple knows a Tala Hanim the Hotch at Wilkoni Araman. A Hadalide, Talok Anim Nahi, Vanilla, and Clory Inish, as Kudwag and the Scale to Avan Low Valley. A Hul ain Tal with Lob than Kate Lonella, Drama by Courage in the Akup, Nachnano or Shinger. My wee Tishkin Tan are sad at Hanga, Agas at Hanahus the Hotch as at Hilmage, and he has to win our night of the Hurumil, a while as she go to the pump, Samank. Volma to Gelge, Ags Volum to start the winter as no log anim nahi, the Ducha Mocha, Fado. Jethwe, Mass, Ags Mortus, Kinne, her lesson. Shane. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, I guess what really struck me about that was where you said that, you know, from the place names you can learn the language, you can learn Irish, you can learn your family history. Um, and especially in relation to what you said earlier about, say, tourists who come in for a brief time and miss that, or children who aren't taught that in school. So it's quite the opposition. And, it, you know, what the language and what place names offer us. Um, could you speak a bit more about that, about the connection to family history, the language, the community, the pride that we can find in this? Okay, well, I suppose the um, the fields here are so small, there's, they're actually tiny and they're subdivided. So my, my family, we could have two fields here where my house is now, and then the next field is maybe uh, 300, 400 yards out the road. Um, they, um, 
And the tourists come in, they just look at the fields, they just say, oh, look, you know, you've very little grass here. And they're given a sort of sound bite as to how the land was developed, how the land was made. Um, in our on our island community now, we have, um, we'd have children in the primary school and in the secondary school who, whose people are not from here, or they might have a, a parent from the mainland and a parent from the island, but they're not um, landowners you can use the word owner when there's so little land, but they, they, they're not involved in this business or indeed in the fishing business because we also have place names relating to all of the, the seashore. Um, so I think uh, I think it's very important because uh, there's a story, especially if you teach children the stories, and some of the stories are actually very funny. Uh, some of the stories are... Uh, sort of sound a bit like Finn McCool and um, so uh, I think we could teach we could have a project based on that um, not just for the children whose parents are not from the island but uh, but also for the children who are involved in another kind of business you don't when I go out for a walk now I see very few children out with their parents and um, even uh, they all have tractors or cars now. We didn't have that in my day, uh, but you don't even see them in the tra on the tractor or in the, or in the car going out to to the cow. They probably come out once or twice a year when there's a new calf, which is would be a big event. But otherwise, they're not really involved. They have another life altogether, which is probably closer to the kind of uh, lives they would have if they lived on the mainland or maybe even in a city. So they're kind of cut out. So I think uh, I think it's something it's something I've been thinking about myself, um, probably because I'm I'm by trade a primary school teacher. Um, there's also the fact that um, as a teacher, you tend to say, well, the parents should do that. That should come from the home. But in this case, only about half of the parents would be you know would be able to do that because they don't have the island background uh, themselves. So I think. Yes, the some of the words, our language. The 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 you were speaking earlier about the dialects and um, three major dialects, but we also have these dialects that are kind of mixed. Um, my Irish would be slightly different to Michal's. It was interesting listening to Michal there reading uh, naturally uh, earlier on. Our pronunciations would be slightly different. We'd have some different phrases, words and phrases, and our island is very close to the. We're in County Galway. Three Iron Islands and County Galway, but in sheer, it's only six miles from uh, the Clare coast. So our Irish was influenced by the Munster dialect, uh, so our Irish would be slightly different. But that has, uh, has also been eroded. That's kind of going, gone nearly now because um, we're all kind of learning school Irish, I suppose, rather than what our the language that our the, very, the variety, I suppose, that our our ancestors had. So we're losing out in a lot of words. The language is getting uh, simplified, I suppose is the word. So I think, yes, it is important for the language. It's also important as regards, I mean, tourism could ruin places like this where you have too much foot up, footfall. It won't happen overnight, but over the years, like what's, what's it going to be like in 20, 30 years' time? So I think for ourselves, for the people living here, we need to be very sure who we are and that we're proud of our place we don't ruin our natural environment we don't let the tourists ruin it we don't ruin it ourselves either so yes i think it is important and in a sense i suppose it, being on the island and exploring it and knowing the names and knowing the history keeps you tied to that to that um the importance yes of that. i think so i think so yes Yes, and even if you leave, uh, and a lot of our younger people now, the younger generation living here, people in their thirties and forties, most of them have have been uh, have lived elsewhere. A lot of them have been spent years in Australia, even New Zealand, America, and have come home. So I think it's important for yeah, it is very important for the next for the next generation. And then if you're proud of your own little patch even though our island is so small you're going to have more respect for other places that you live in especially as regards the environment and protecting our natural environment yeah. that's wonderful thank you very much fantastic thank you
Um, so now um, we will move to two of my friends in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and um, Hannah O'Regan and Charisma Rangipunga have written um, Apakura, which is a lament, and it takes us on a, a a journey through the South Island of New Zealand of Te Wai Pounamu. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Hannah and Charisma? And thank you to the speakers who have gone before us for opening up the opportunity to us to um, follow in your footsteps. And importantly, follow in the footsteps in terms of the connection between our language, our ancestral languages, and our connection to our identity and our land. Um, Moira, you've just finished with talking around um, that, that connection around the language and the importance of what we might call kaitiaki or te kaitiaki taka, the, the guardianship and the role of protecting the environment for the place that you live in. And certainly that has been the element that has driven us within this uh, apakura, within this lament. Uh, for us, we come from a people who have not had um, the opportunity to have heard our language as the vernacular for nearly a hundred years. Uh, Charisma and I are second language speakers and our families. Uh, the language has pretty much been lost within this part of the country for uh, in some context more than four generations uh, so with that comes a loss and a dislocation uh, in terms of the understanding of place names but also the understanding of the stories and the narratives that connect us to our place and in our culture uh, the land its features isn't merely a, a, an aspect of geography it is a it is our ancestors so we we personify the land, we personify the water, we personify all those features as part of our heritage and we connect ourselves uh, intricately to it. We can recite our genealogy back to those places. Uh, and so when you've been dislocated from that and you don't have the ability to give voice to that narrative, to give voice to that story, there's a huge sense of loss and not only in being able to articulate your own connection to it, but also be able to celebrate uh, and recognise the things that are happening to those places themselves. So our apukura, our lament, is a recognition that with that dislocation, with the uh, act of colonisation and the the act of taking our people away from the roles of protecting our land and being connected to it, uh, that a lot has started to happening, a lot of, of uh, negative things of, in terms of the environmental impact uh, has started to um, really be come to the fore. And there are places that we now, uh, especially if we think 50 years ahead, uh, there are places that we can see are going to be severely impacted by those environment, environmental uh, environmental changes uh, and we don't have the language to give to the land but we also don't have the language for ourselves to to partake in that lament so this is what we've tried to do follow a traditional style of composition uh, where we create and compose a chant uh, that not only takes us through that journey uh, but also tells the story, the narrative of what is happening uh, to the places, to that connection, and uh, recognise the pain that goes with that language loss and uh, the, the loss of that identity as well. Hoi anō, tēnei te mihi atu, kia koutou, i whā e mihi ana, kia koe e manaaki ana i tēnei kaupapa. Hoi anō, kia koutou, ngā mana o Airani, nei rā te mihi kia koutou. Just to follow on from Hana's explanation, really for us there's a lost knowledge of, in humanity itself, and that is uh, the interdependency of uh, the well-being of, uh, of people, of humanity, uh, and that of our natural environment. Uh, and uh, this lament really is trying to encourage us uh, to remember that all of our actions, 
uh, whether it being uh, taking the kids to school in the car in the morning as opposed to walking them down the road uh, or buying those bulk made processed products uh, that are heavily packaged in plastic wrapping, um, that that all has an effect on uh, the well-being of the natural environment and long-term our well-being uh, as humanity uh, and that we need to remember that we are interconnected and that our actions have consequences uh, and certainly traditionally uh, in our culture uh, that was uh, the reverence and the respect that our ancestors uh, had for the natural environment that we've forgotten uh, as time has moved on. So really it's a call for us and for our young ones to remember um, that relationship uh, and the interconnectedness that we have with the natural environment. So if we are to start on our lament and that we would like to share with you, um, as I said, we personify the features of our land as we go through this. There are four sections uh, that identify four places of significance to both Charisma and I. And as we journey, we generally start from a place like a map, like a like a journey. We start from one place and we go in sequence uh, around uh, around our tribal territory uh, that brings us to those places of significance. We talk in the lament to the places themselves. And so we don't refer to them as a third person, but our dialogue is actually directly with them. Uh, and the first place that we start with, the, the two places within my, um, within my heritage that we decided to uh, center on, starts right at the bottom of the South Island uh, where my marae or my tribal village is uh, almost sub-Antarctic. We're like right down the bottom there. It's pretty cold and for many people they don't know why why our ancestors went there to live. But it's a, for us it's a beautiful place. But it's a place where um, one of, it's a significant um, place that is also of significant concern environmentally for us. It's a place called Tiwai. And at the moment, Tiwai is also the aluminium smelter. It's a place where the, the biggest factory in New Zealand uh, currently resides of the aluminium smelter that has for a long time now brought in a significant income into New Zealand. But the environmental degradation that has happened because of that smelter uh, and even though many of our people have had work within it, um, the environmental degradation is, is, is huge. Um, the company that's actually Australian owned, and we're not having any remarks on our um, Australian neighbours, but the Australian owners of that smelter have decided that they will no longer continue and they're about to leave, but what they're leaving are pools of toxic, toxic waste that our people and our community and our villages are left to um, hold. And we, there hasn't been, there's only now just recently been the acknowledgement that this level of toxic waste is going to be left behind. So as a people, what we're doing is we're looking into the future and we are saying, well, um, we are now aware that there are all this, all of this toxicity that we have left and we are asking for forgiveness to the land that has been our protector and our barrier uh, in terms of its physical feature for our people for a long time. From there, we go to Auraki. From there, we go to Auraki. So Auraki for us here in the South Island uh, is our principal mountain. Uh, he is it. Uh, there is no mountain that compares to him. He just also happens to be the tallest mountain here in New Zealand. So we hold him in high regard. Uh, and um, the upper kura first starts to talk about that regard and that respect that we have for Auraki, for him, um, and the place that traditionally he is held uh, for our iwi here in the South Island. Um, the second verse of uh, uh, about Auraki actually talks about the predicted impacts 
of climate change on Auraki. So uh, he's pretty tall uh, and he has always uh, got a snow covering. Uh, and what we know um, from climate scientists is that uh, it is likely that within the next 100 years uh, that his snow cap will actually disappear completely for months at a time. Uh, now, that has significant impact uh, on us as a nation, but also on us as a people for Māori dim, uh, the head and the dressing of the head, um, it speaks to your chiefliness, it speaks to your mana, to your mantle, uh, and for him to lose that uh, because of the actions of humanity, of us, uh, it, it's very sad. So it's us talking to that mountain about the anticipated impacts that he is going to feel and that he's going to see um, due to our actions and, and apologising to him um, because uh, of that. And our tribal mountain, from the base of our tribal mountain flows the river Waitaki and that is our tribal river. And that river flows to the coast which marks the area which another one of my villages um, resides and that is uh, the village of Moiraki one of the urupa or the cemeteries and, and again to Mihal and the, the connection to those that are buried in the land and the stories and the narratives that are often untold that draws me to that place uh, the name of the place is Tikoraki so it's a, this little cemetery that is up on the hill, it's up on a cliff, a beautiful outlook. If you're going to be buried in a place, it's a beautiful place to be buried and it looks out into the sea. But what we are finding in this ancient cemetery of ours uh, is that with, again, climate change, with the sea level rising, the impact on the on that cliff is that it is eroding into the sea. And as it erodes into the sea, so too the bones of our ancestors fall. And the, the sacred resting sites, which are meant to be the place where you rest forever in peace, are literally being unearthed and falling down and being captured by the, our God of the sea and taken into places and, and spread in, in all directions. My um, ancestress is buried in that place. My children's, um, my daughter's placenta is buried in that cemetery. And so with this connection, this really strong connection to place, we ask the question, where will we go to actually recognize the, the history, that, that, that narrative of the past and our connection to place? Where will we go to cry and, and celebrate the journeys and the achievements of people in times to come if the reality is that those are falling into the sea and eroding with time? and the importance of retaining the memories of old and the legacies of old as we look to sharing those stories with the future generations. From the coast uh, of Moiraki, we travel north uh, to my part of the neighbourhood, to my part of the island, uh, and to our lake. And our lake is called Wairewa. Um, and uh, it's very significant in maori uh that uh, when you have guests, that you're able to feed your guests. Uh, it is a sign of wealth that uh, you can welcome guests into your homes uh, and that you are able to lay in front of them delicacies uh, from your region and that they leave uh, with full stomachs. Uh, certainly it is a sign uh, that you're not doing so well if your guests are leaving hungry. Uh, the lake uh, in my region is famous for uh, a particular delicacy, which is eels, uh, tuna, they're known to us. Uh, now the eel, the tuna, is a very... Um, it's a very hardy species uh, and uh, can cope with a lot of change in its environment. Uh, unlike a lot of other fish species, the eel is quite resistant. Um, but you know if the eel species starts de uh, declining, uh, that actually the quality of uh, your waterways uh, are significantly um, uh, impacted. Uh, and so I talk to my lake uh, and I talk about the fact that that lake has fed us uh, and our ancestors for generations uh, and that 
Uh, we are in a state of well-being now because of what the lake has offered to us. Um, but uh, that lake over uh, the last five or six generations has seen significant change. The hillsides surrounding the lake have been deforested, which has meant that there is a lot of uh, sediment and runoff now going into the lake. Uh, and the lake and the water quality within the lake are changing, uh, which means our fish species are changing and being impacted and uh, not in as healthy a state as we would like. Uh, and um, again, we talk to the lake, we apologise to the lake uh, because uh, the changes in the lake are due to, again, to human activity. Uh, and so we talk about that and we own uh, and take responsibility for it um, and lament uh, the changes of, of the lake. So while this, the, the, the upper kura, the lament in its entirety, is an apology, it's a recognition and an apology to our ancestors of, of the land, and their features. It is also hopefully uh, a warning sign to our children and our grandchildren. Uh, if we lose this connection, we lose in essence who we are as a people. Mm -hmm. And with it, we'll lose not only the language, but the voice of the environment and the meaning, the meaning of our culture, our heritage, in terms of what we need to be into the future. So with that, we'd like to present to you our lament. What we're going to do, um, it's a little bit different. Usually, obviously, we sing this in chant form. We're going to um, mix it up a little bit and sing you a few lines and then read um, the body of the text uh, before we end with, again, in our chant form. So kia are are mai. Please bear with us as we, uh, as we engage in this lament. Te apukura ki ka tipuna. Tiwa i e E taku tau ara i e Mai a rawa nei te tirohaka Hei kai mo te whatu mo te tini o tahu me he ori ori tō rite ki te manawa, te rā te wā, he auahi, he aura, taku wahi, e kāroa. E i e, e au e ana te waha o awarua, ko kākāwau e tū kau noa, kei hea rā aku tau rakea. Ka papi mai tero, ka kiko kore taku kaeka, i te whenua are are nei. Ka tahi ko ka tau tuku roa, ma te ahai e nei kupu mōhau. E apakura nei, e paua e. Aura ki e, ka matatū i te au, ka matatū i te pō, hei pirika mō tō rahi e, ko tō ama ariki ka noho ki te whare pua hairi. E, i, e pō ua. Ki tai hoa rā ka tīwani, ka hewa tō pane, ka tarahi noa te huka, ko tō pō tai mau roa kākaro. Ko kā hihi tī kākā o tamanui e, nei ko te pūmahana taka o te ao. E pōua no hoku te he. Tika ora ki e Taku rupa Ariki ha e kawa roi mata 
nā haurā a mamai i mamahu no kamata o rau takata. He kiteka, he mahara, e taku pirika haumaru. E e Horo ana ka ko iwi o akuri I te pirika o tauma ki ka tai patupari o raro Ko ka riteka o mua ko tukuna I ka moe ka mauroa ko karo O waiata ka rakona i ka karu Ko wawa ki ka au o auanoa Tai hoa a mahara ka rerehu Akuri kore mai rai E taku punara wai re wai I kere a mai koe E tu whakaroria e Ko te karamata o tō wai I tā wiriwiri te kānui Hei kai mā te mano mano mako e E E taku moana wai re wā Ko tope a te nehe nehe Naku naku nei tō honoka ki a takaroa He tū tahakaroa tā hau Ka pararaha tō takere, i ka para i o pare pare ka tūmore. Ka piro ko te wai, ka hā hā ko te tūna. E taku roto no hoku te hei. Kia ora koutou. Tēnā koroa. Hey, tino atahua, uh, tena, no, namihi. That was very beautiful. Thank you very much, um, both of you. Um, wow. Can you, I guess, speak a little bit more about um, how that allows you, how the apakura allows you to perhaps communicate with, but also communicate on behalf of the whenua, on behalf of the land? So could you speak? elaborate on that? I, I think some cultures might think we're a little bit weird um, that when we we do actually speak to the land so when we go to a place we often uh, directly acknowledge we, we we make formal speeches to our land but we also sing to it uh, we sing to it as an ancestor we sing to it as our the place that holds the bones and the connections of our people as well uh, and because of that, it's it's easy to feel that connection and also the sorrow, you know, that the, the whole gamut of emotions can come through when we are um, engaging in that cultural practice. As we, um, as we as language learners, as people who are passionate around our language, you know, as we embark on the, our own language journey, this has been something that has helped us uh, establish a really strong footing, I think, in terms of our identity. We, we have a term in Māori called Tūraka Waiwai, and Tūraka Waiwai is the place literally where you're able to stand, your feet are able to stand. And because of those ancestral connections, you are able to give voice. You have a mandate to speak. So we have gone to these places within our own Tūraka Waiwai, where we have the mandate to speak on behalf of the place, but also on behalf of the ancestors that have traversed those very places themselves. That brings with it a responsibility as well, a responsibility to not only celebrate that connection, but also talk a, a, to future generations about what is required to make sure that there will be something that is culturally persistent in terms of that legacy, in terms of that narrative. Uh, and, and we were sad about what, what we've allowed to happen even in our own lifetime. You know, not only with language loss and cultural loss, 
you know, we don't have the, as the much control as our ancestors, I think, would have liked us to have over those places. We're governed by other laws. Uh, we can't do what we might want to do. Uh, but even more than that, we see so many of the people who, who should be connected to those places uh, be absolutely dislocated from it. So to give them voice, to give their story voice, to bring voice to the experiences that they are having right now, uh, we see as a responsibility that we have uh, for us and for the generations after us. I think to, um, to follow on from Hannah, um, it, it, it's very common for us in Māoridom to talk about, um, so for instance, if I take Auraki, our mountain, uh, to talk about his feelings as if he is imbuing them on us when we, when we go to visit him. Uh, so for instance, uh, we could turn up to the mountain uh, on a day uh, and it will be um, cloudy and overcast uh, and he will be hidden uh, within a shroud of mist. Uh, and it's common for us to say, oh, well, he's, the old fella's a bit grumpy today. Uh, he doesn't want to come out. You know, he's hidden himself. He's not coming out to, to acknowledge and to greet us. So actually, what is he grumpy about and what's happening and what do we need to actually think about? Uh, and then there will be other days when we'll turn up and it will be as clear uh, as it could possibly be and he's out in all of his gloom. Oh, that's great. He's in a happy mood. Uh, you know, so actually having a think about um, if the land uh, was, uh, well, and is like us and had emotions and feelings, um, actually, where do those emotions and feelings, uh, where are they uh, being derived from and what's causing him to be happy uh, or to be grumpy? And is there something that we can do to help improve uh, what's going on there? Uh, and so just, I guess for us, it's also about reminding our children that uh, to talk to the land and to talk to the water and actually take some time to just be uh, with it and understand nature um, and, and take all of the messages that they're getting uh, from nature on board in terms of their own uh, actions and activities when it comes to the environment. Okay. Um, and so when you, I guess, when you, um, when you communicate with the, with the land, I, um, will I be correct in saying that that bolsters or elevates that sense of um, uh, kaitiakitanga or um, like or, and the responsibilities that come with that and the feelings that surround that so the language is a, is a, a, ve a vehicle for that in, in a sense is that is that something could I think anyone who anyone who is passionate and or loves dearly their native language knows that uh, if you don't use it, sometimes you run the risk of losing it. The more you speak about it, the more you connect it to place and people and community and history and, and social narrative, the more alive it becomes. Uh, we, for a long time within our people, if we, we, we're acutely aware of the void that is created with language loss where the, the walls of your houses don't hear your people sing, where they don't hear the histories and the debates or even the arguments of families between each other, uh, where your tribal houses no longer are familiar, become, they're no longer familiar with, their, with the stories of creation or the stories of the, the legends of your people. Um, when that is silenced, you lose so much. So when we are in a place and we're able to bring through song, through composition, through writing, uh, those stories alive again, where we can hear our children running around and they can in t in, in, as well hear a little bit about those stories where literally the walls of the house can be painted by the narratives of our ancestors and also the dreams of our future, then what we do is we help bring to life that connection of language and identity to place. Uh, so it's incredibly important to us as people who are at the forefront of our language revitalization goal within our own people, uh, we are continuously composing. We are 
supporting our youth to compose themselves. We are bringing to life the stories that for a long time have been silenced and giving them the just place to stand with them on the platform and on the stage uh, within our own communities. Uh, and that that can not only, it, it not only keeps the language alive, but it helps you feel good about yourself as a people and about that heritage. We can actually celebrate the negative stuff too. You know, we can celebrate the fact that by rights of colonization and what's happened upon our people, that it's a miracle that we are able to stand here and speak to you in our language at all. Uh, by all rights, we shouldn't even exist, but we do. We are persisting, and not only are we persisting in really stubbornly, culturally defined, uh, that we are bringing new voice to the to that identity and to that narrative and to that legacy. And we want to make sure that connection is something that is fostered and nurtured in the next generation. So yes, uh, absolutely for our the passion the passion and the connection to identity, to place, to language um, is strengthened, it is given shape, it is given place, and it is given voice uh, through the efforts of the people that we have been able to be honoured in terms of joining with today. Nareira, e kore mimiti te puno mihi kia tātou nga koutou anō i tuku tēnei āhei taka kia mātou. Um, kia ora. So um, I guess I'd like to open the discussion up to everyone else. Um, we've all her heard the wonderful pieces today and uh, let's chat a little bit more about that together. Well, I, I, I loved that lament. Um, it reminded me of two things. First of all, shamo singing, which we have in Irish, which is unaccompanied singing, uh, still very much alive in the Irish speaking areas. Uh, but also to remind me more of what we call the queen or the keening, uh, which was a cry or keening the dead, which was alive in Ireland until about maybe a hundred years ago. And there were there were professional women who used to come and keen and lament the dead in an official way and they would compose lines. And the most famous, of course, is Queen Arthur Lady, uh, the Queen of Arthur Lady, which is about, I think, maybe four or 500 lines uh, about Arthur Lady, who was um, killed by the English in the 17th century, I think. Uh, that's the most famous one, but there are many, many more ones as well. And they were alive until about maybe 100 years ago. Um, partly, the, I know the Catholic Church was against them and life was changing so and so on. Um, but some of them, you know, we know, we know the words. We have, rec we have made recordings of what they would have sound like over, over the years. Um, Professor Bernard Madigan did a book, a book about this, uh, Queen Tiagos Kjolta. Uh, I know part of this project going down the road is to translate each other's work. So I'm really um, excited about translating your work into Irish and getting uh, one of the good Shano singers, and we have many of them, the folk singers who sing in Irish. And and, and even they sound kind of similar, the, the way you sing it sounds kind of similar to our Shano's singing, uh, which is, as I say, very much alive in, in the Irish language. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to being involved in that part of the project in the next few months and, and see if we can if we can um, find a home, a comfortable home for it in the Irish language also, which I think we will, which we will do. Kia ora. We have, um, w w I'm interested when you talk about the keening because we, uh, we have something similar where we fare well the dead, but the they're not prescribed, they're not recited lines. Mm. Um, they are composed at the point of, at the point of the ceremony. Uh, so they'll never, they follow a, a set format, but they don't necessarily, they don't follow the similar lines. So they're, uh, what do we call them? Impromptu compositions. And yep. we do that particularly to farewell the dead. 
So on the death of somebody, it sounds quite different from what we were doing, but I think it is similar to the keening that you talk about, yeah. uh, where we yeah. uh, engage in an actual dialogue between two people, and that dialogue yeah. is farewelling, it's what, what we call the karaka or the, the karanga, the call, and that is the call. We literally go into the world of the, the spirits as we uh, lament uh, and farewell the farewell the person that might have passed. Yeah, well, well that, that very sounds, excited. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds very familiar, actually, because part of our king would be extempore, so they compose lines on the spot, uh, but also they would draw mm. lines from the tradition uh, that might have composed mm. uh, some lines beforehand. So it's a mixture of of of, of everything. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, that, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, we're going to wrap up now. Um, thank you everyone at home as well for, for joining us. And if you uh, would like to watch some more sessions, you can go to www.kirch.ie. And perhaps if you'd like to make a donation, you can go to www.kirch.ie forward slash support dash us. Um, again, thank you so much um, to all our contributors today. Emiliana Kia Kogu, Gavramila Mayagov, and um, yeah, Kia ora, Sloan. Thank you very much. Bye bye.